All right. Well, uh, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome, everybody, to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a couple of great guests who have done a really, really nifty project that I'm really looking forward to exploring, and I can't wait to start this week's conversation. Now, one of the things we've been doing in the Future Trends Forum is looking at creative work. And over the years, we've surfaced a wide range of creative projects, including games, including software, and of course, a great deal of books. Now what we have is a fascinating set of artifacts. And these are, if you will, transmissions from the future. They're educational products and services. I don't want to say more about them. I want to save that for a reveal from the creators that point out possible directions that higher education could go. And these were created by a team led by our two guests at KnowledgeWorks. So without any further ado, let me just bring each of them up on stage. To begin with, Catherine Prince. And good afternoon, Catherine. Hello, Brian. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to see you. Where are you today? I'm in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm based. KnowledgeWorks, my organization is based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Ah, oh, so you have the two great urban conglomerations of Ohio wrapped it out. We do. That's very good. And of course, viewers will notice that uh, Catherine and I have the bookshelf background milieu just nailed, I think, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Catherine, um, at KnowledgeWorks, I'm curious, what are you going to be doing for the next year? What are the big projects and what are the big topics that are uppermost in your mind? Um. So we're going to be releasing a new foresight paper on future educator roles. So some provocations to imagine how might we staff K through 12 education systems to be more responsive mm -hmm. to learners' needs and more um, adapted to the way the world is changing and better places for adults to work. And then um, Jason and I, along with others on our strategic foresight team, will be starting the research and the writing on our triennial forecasts on the future of learning where we take a step back and take a fresh look at what's on the horizon for learning. So that's that's going to be a, a big piece over the next year to come out next late summer, early fall. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that. Please, please make a point of sharing that with us so we can see it and partake and also spread the word. Uh, Thank you. We'll do it. Oh, that sounds great, Catherine. Well, well, hang on a second. While I've got you, let me get your colleague on stage so that we can complete the picture. And this is Jason Swanson, who's a senior director of uh, at uh, Strategic Foresight at KnowledgeWorks. Jason, hello, sir. Hey, Brian. How's it going? All right. Where have we found you? Uh, so I am located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So like our colleague Ed, also recovering from uh, a series mm. of bad storms and a few mm. tornadoes last night. Crikey. Well, I'm glad to, I'm glad to see you're well. I hope uh, you and yours are safe and sound. We are. We are. Thank you. Oh, good. Good. Well, let me let me throw the same question that at you that I just threw at Catherine. What are you going to be working on for the next year? Yeah, so fantastic question. Um, so in addition to what Catherine's outlined, we're also wrapping up a project in partnership with our friends at Assessment for Good, taking mm -hmm. a look at futures for asset based formative assessment. Uh, we anticipate that that should come out maybe early fall, perhaps late summer. So we're working on the deliverable for that now. Um, and then we're also looking at some engagements that are a little bit more experiential in nature mm. um, through hopefully South by Southwest EDU um, mm -hmm. and then a, a, a few of those engagements locally to support a broader, broader regional planning strategy. Planning for what? Uh, a conglomeration of districts uh, that are wow. thinking pretty radically about how to best serve their young people. Um, so really, really thrilled to be a part of that work and, and help them ask questions of the future together with their communities. Excellent. Excellent. Well, good luck. Good luck. That's a lot of Thank stuff. And, and when you're ready to submit something to South by Southwest EDU, let us know so we can juice up the uh, panel picker for you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, um, it's very kind of both of you to join us. In fact, here, let me rearrange the screen, make it a little more convivial. And uh, and let's, I, I want to begin by asking you, first of all, and, and friends, if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask our guests a couple of like very, very basic questions to introduce their, their topic and their work. But as we go, please think of the questions you'd like to ask them. 
And you should also be able to see in the bottom left of the screen a kind of tan colored box that says connections to the future. Click that and that'll take you to their website with their PDF or their project. Um, I, I have to ask, how did you, first of all, how did you come up with this idea? What led you to this idea, this kind of design thinking, this kind of future science fiction uh, artifact creation? What, what led you to that process and how did it go? So um, I, I think the shortest answer would be uh, back in 2020, uh, we published a forecast exploring uh, future possibilities for liberatory education. And kind of along the way, we, we find, found ourselves grappling with, with the issue that, like in so many broad aspirational futures, the folks go, well, it, theoretically, I get it, but I don't, I, I don't always feel tied to it, right? I, I need some level of specificity. Mm. So as we started mm. to think about, you know, the ways we might address this problem, um, Stuart Candy and a uh, cadre of folks had won the core 77 design awards and their project probed this idea that it is, it's, it's a hard question to ask what we want for the future sometimes, especially with specificity and granularity. Mm. So we mm. took a lot of inspiration for Stuart from Stuart and colleagues who were using kind of design futures to create artifacts or totems to link to. So we, we wanted to create a strong set of connections and, a, and strong sets of linkages. So, so when people go, you know, I understand the theory. I just, but for my context, I just don't get it. So, you know, as you know, part of foresight, it's making and managing assumptions, but it's also seeding new ideas and new possibilities. Mm -hmm. So we saw um, sort of design futures uh, as a way to kind of create the, those kind of concrete, but I think of them as just future anchor points. So that we, when we say like, what's this mean in my context, it's more object oriented. We could touch it, we could hold it. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it could spark more thinking around possibilities and, and trade-offs. Oh, fascinating, thank you. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, Catherine, did you want to add to that or do you want to dive into how you made it work? Um, I'm happy to dive into how we made it work. So um, we started by generating ideas for like what are things that could exist in liberatory education futures where people and systems prioritize self-determination, human potential and learners right to participate in the shaping the world by convening um, an in-person workshop where we brought together various education constituents to, to start ideating um, kind of in three-dimensional ways. So it was, like, it was a workshop full of all sorts of materials and using um, various kind of feeds. So we, we drew upon the Institute for the Future's work in designing artifacts from the future. We, we, we drew um, upon aphorisms from the future card game and other mm -hmm. sources to kind of kind of compile a variety of ways of kind of saying how might we incent creative thinking about things that could exist in the future to help make liberatory education possibilities more real. So we took we had in our original forecast a set of implications for people to consider as they continued to grapple with the ideas that we'd raised there. So we said if we're in a liberatory education future and we're addressing these kinds of implications, you know, what might exist? And, and so we, we we took people through three rounds of design using different starting points to help generate a whole bunch of possibilities they could draw, they could write. And one of the stations they were building, um, really trying to fill the room with ideas and, mm. and get people going through a rapid ideation process. And then the participants in the workshop reflected uh, with us on kind of what have we made, what are we seeing, you know, what what what's standing out, um, and and refine some of the ideas further, and then our writing team, our Knowledge Works Foresight team, um, took all that and started to make sense of it, and you know, we we built out some of what had come from that workshop into the artifacts from the future that appear in the publication, and. Um, I think a couple of them, we just, we continued generating ideas ourselves using the same approaches um, so that we kind of had a balance that we didn't want them to be all tech-based or, you know, we wanted to bring, kind of bring in different dimensions and make sure that all of the implications we had seen for liberatory education futures were addressed in some way. 
that, this sounds like a fantastic process. I'm just, I, I'm as you're describing this, so I'm imagining doing this in different ways and participating in, in and and what we might make with this. Uh, and when when did it when did it wrap up? When did you first complete the you know the series of artifacts? So we we had the workshop in it was February twenty twenty three, right? And we I published so. yeah, and we published the paper about a year ago. So it so we had we probably had like three months between when we had the workshop and when we handed the final words of all our thinking over to our design team and, and the illustrators to help bring them to life. Nice, nice. Well, it's it's great stuff, and I have to say. I'm just the moderator here. I'm I'm, I'm not going to run the whole program. I'm not going to be the, the the guest, right? But I have to say, I I love these products. I, I these artifacts. I wish I could be in that world so much. Um, they they all just just warm my heart so much. Um, but um, if you everyone, if you haven't seen it yet, um, uh, our guests have mentioned a great great little card game project called The Thing from the Future. Um, I'll put a link to it in the chat. This is a, um, a free tool, and you can buy cards of it as well, uh, which gets people to, it gives them a structure to produce an artifact from the future. Uh, I've used this with just thousands of people. It's a really, really nifty uh, prompt. I really recommend using it. Um, well, I guess I, I'd like to ask another question, which is, well, first of all, a kind of level setting question. When you're talking about the future of education, this seems to be for K through 12, higher education and lifelong informal learning. Is that right? It is. I think, you know, in, we probably lean toward the K through 12 years in this publication because we were specifically querying, you know, could public education systems become liberatory in 10 or more years? And a lot of the ideas in the represented in the artifacts are not limited to what we think of as the K through 12 system today. A lot of them are in kind of that out of school time or life wide learning space. Um, and I think even if we told the story of an artifact based on somebody who might be in the K through 12 years or just after, I feel like some of the artifacts could apply to people of other ages and certainly the ways of thinking um, could apply through in any kind of educational setting. Very good. Very good. And then if I could ask the two of you, of all these artifacts, which which ones are your favorites now? Which ones really speak to you and inspire you? So, I, I, I my personal favorite out of these is is one called the Learning Palooza. Yeah, and you know this was really uh, about what might happen if young people in a community through a celebration of learning by and for learners. Uh, so it was really interesting kind of thinking through that. So how might learners take that on? What might it look like? Um, what effect might it have uh, for us and sort of the constructs of the liberatory framework? Uh, we're, we're obviously really interested in the idea of agency and impact. So how might this celebration impact learners and also in turn impact the world around them? Um, and you know, we were able to draw a lot of inspiration um, from some some current partners do, doing the work, most certainly groups like Remake Learning and the Remake Learning Day celebration. So we were able to kind of riff on these ideas and say, well, what would happen if a community made this entirely youth-led, if it happened four times a year, and what might some of the after effects be? So for our scenario, um, some of the young people in this future created uh, a local chapter of the NAACP uh, as something being uh, vital and important to them. Um, but, you know, I like it. I, I like, so I think future celebrations and future rituals are really important, thinking of the ways we might come together. Um, so that one really spoke to me. Well, I like the sound of that a lot. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we could do a learning palooza in all kinds of ways. Um, Catherine, how about you? I, I know these are these are all your darlings. But which, which of these, you can't play favorites, but which of these really stands out for you now? Uh, one of them that stands out for me is human AI or human humani. Yeah. Um, partly because of the energy that was behind the prototypes or workshop participants oh. put to it, but also I think because of where the idea landed. So human AI 
it would be a wearable device for education um, that the full term we imagined was holistic humanity actualizer and then it got shortened down to human AI. Um, and the idea is that it would be an AI powered wearable that let youth connect in real places on their time on, on their time and on their terms for the reasons that mattered to them. So I like that it's using um, a technology that's rapidly gaining power, mm -hmm. but in a, in a human centered way, in a youth empowered mm -hmm. oriented way. So we were again thinking about safety and security concerns, which are of course so profound. We were imagining that there may be a community of youth age 15 to 19 who could use it. I think you could say the same tool could be used with older learners, with people in other walks of life who may not be enrolled in formal learning institutions. Um, but it would be, you know, kind of have enough privacy and security to to help reveal what people chose to about themselves, but then also be this powerful connector um, so people could meet up maybe just for one, you know, let, let's work on something together once and maybe for some kind of ongoing peer to peer learning. Well, it, it, it seemed like a, a benign alternative to some social media connectors, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, perhaps to meet up. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like that one very much as well. In the in the chat, uh, our friend Mark Corbett Wilson uh, on the West Coast says, uh, let's meet up in the Iberobile, uh, which is an alternative uh, kind of bookmobile library uh, entity. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, Catherine, um, you said that the Humani or human AI, it, it it elicited so much energy from participants. What did, what did they do in this workshop? I mean, give, give us a sense of, of the kind of practical stuff they were up to. Yeah, so I, I remember, Jason, you may remember other details, but I remember that several, uh, I think individuals or pairs of people had come up with like different 3D objects that were wearables to help the learning connectors and then they pulled their ideas. So I think they were like three different ideas that came up. So people were taking like tinker toys and tape and plastic oh. tubes and all sorts of like play materials that we had for them to build with and and representing these concepts. And I, I liked that the energy was that like they were coming from three, I think at least three different sources. They like, there's something here. If that, you know, different people are thinking of something in this space. So and then the, um, the the prototypes that they made out of these objects that we had in the room were so colorful and they, they had a lot of energy around the potential. We, as the writing team, we inserted more of the like privacy and security cautions and like, how would this really work? But that first idea of like, what, what the power of AI to drive connection, you know, was really vivid in the room. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you you had the power and the technological possibilities, but also just that pressing need that I think was expressed across all three groups of saying, what are the ways that we can come across lines of difference, right? So that social cohesion aspect, I think, was a deeply held value for everybody in the room, but particularly those three groups that then said, we see possibilities in all of these things to get at a like a cohesion accelerator, right? Yeah, and one aspect that I think is important too is that this artifact humanity like, re reflects a shift in power dynamics. So if we're thinking about, it's hard for liberatory education to thrive in our current systemic structures, whatever level of education we're talking about. This is one that really puts the power in the hands of youth to say kind of how and where learning is happening through for them. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, these these are very very sweet. Um, uh, all of these. Um, one, let me ask one more question, if I could, and, and then I really want to turn it over to the audience to see uh, what they, what questions they have. Um, for each of these artifacts, you have a nice page and a half describing them in great detail, and then you have connections to liberatory education insights. And I think, if I if I understand this correctly, that's a series of principles that all the participants agreed on early in the workshop. Is, is that right, or am I getting this wrong? So uh, you're very close. So we drew those um, from the liberatory education forecast that we've released in 2020. 
Um, so we took all the implications that were generated for that and used those as design principles. So our first task when we convened this group was to say like, hey, you know, this is our definition for liberatory education. How might you define it, right? So mm -hmm. then beyond how you might define it, these are sort of our, our overarching implications that we saw in our exploration of the future or what the future was telling us. So rather than to design to the scenarios, maybe we should design to the insights, right? So as you're thinking about things like hum uh, Humani or learning Palooza, first think about a artifact from the future that would think, you know, that would represent something like social cohesion or the idea that narratives hold power for change. And then we kind of uh, unleash them on the design thinking process and, um, so, uh, so yeah, pulled, pulled from that forecast. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you. I mean, that was, it was a really nice grounding for that. And, uh, in the chat, uh, Sean Andres has shared, um, a link to, uh, their forecast for this as well. Um, so we've got a, a small library now of, of materials for you to go through. Um, friends, let me stop, uh, interrogating our poor guests. Uh, let me give you the chance to interrogate. Uh, what questions, what thoughts do you have? Again, if you're new to the forum, look in the very bottom of the screen, that white strip, you've got a couple of buttons. So already the chat box is bubbling away. If you'd like to join us on stage, uh, you can uh, please click the raised hand button. And if you want to type in a question or a thought that you'd like to share, just hit the question mark button and uh, type it in there. Um, while uh, uh, while people are thinking and, and also reading your PDFs and, and, and taking a look through this, uh, let me ask a, a, another question about this. Um, as you're tr did you do any, either in your workshops or afterwards, did you do any kind of backcasting or here to there kind of thinking like what would it take to have a future where a Learnapalooza is active or where the ebrary is uh, is available or um, uh, what was the other one that was really fun that you know that I learn uh, was available did you do any of that kind of uh, analysis uh, so when within the protocol we we gave to folks. One of the questions I, I believe we asked, and, and Catherine, I'm probably going to get the, the exact wording wrong, um, was what has to be true to mm -hmm. get us there, right? right. Um, I don't, that line of thinking didn't necessarily make it into this forecast, but I think, you know, in terms of an engagement process and working with this, that is the question, right? How can we put more shape and form to what we want for the future? What are these artifacts telling us about the ways the future might unfold and can give us insights then to that like that last mile of foresight of like, well, what do we have to do, right? What has to be true? What are the trade-offs for the ramifications? You know, in blunt terms, like who wins and who loses and how can we think maybe with about that with a little bit more nuance? Uh, what are the power dynamics at place? What has to be true in terms of both possibility but also power to get us there? Mm -hmm. That's super yeah. creative. Oh, please go ahead, Catherine, please. Um, yeah, thanks. So some of the descriptions of the artifacts from the future do talk a little bit like how about how we might get there. So it's not necessarily they're not necessarily reflecting like ideal futures at all, but they are like re referring to some of the kinds of forces of change that, that could result in these kinds of things existing. So for example, there are bill um, the kind of private library that's trying to support liberatory exchanges of ideas is was created we imagined in response to political and social pressures that were stripping funding from other institutions and you know um limiting what materials could be shared in them so uh, we try to make them a little bit more real by giving them a, a fake history um mm -hmm. which is different from what you're asking about like if these you know yeah. how might we get yeah. them today there yeah Oh, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, I, I guess I, I would leave this also as a as a productive exercise for anybody listening right now, is, is to take some of these artifacts and think about you know what would it take to be true for that to, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, well, while people are, are are thinking and fuming and coming up with other questions, um, uh, there's there are a couple that really appeal to me from a different angle, and I might mispronounce these. Um, these two were related. One was uh, eco reclaimers, uh, which was a, a, a kind of, if I understand this correctly, a kind of uh, 
uh, education, but practical hands-on education uh, to get people to be working with uh, the physical world around them in the age of the climate crisis. Another one was a, forgive me if it's mispronounced, Dynet or Dnet, uh, which was a, a, a disaster network um, of people uh, to help uh, other people recover from uh, climate disasters. It seemed like you had these two these two futures that were, or these two artifacts are based in the future where we take climate more seriously. Can, can you say a bit more about that pairing? And so, is it all Dynet, did I get it wrong? I, think, I don't I know think, if we I think it was built off the idea of, well, I think it plays on the word diaspora, so it probably is Dnet. Dnet, nice, very mm -hmm. nice. And if, if I'm remembering this too correctly, Catherine, you'll, you'll have to, to help me with this. This stemmed from some from one major idea, right? That was more rooted in the the, the, di the di diaspora portion and that we ended up breaking it apart into two. So both the eco reclaimers and the, and the DNet ended up becoming two distinct artifacts. Mm -hmm. I could be misremembering though. And, you know, I think that um, we had done a little orienting toward thinking about change with the workshop participants so we did some looking back like you know, what was what, were, what was new in 2013 to help them then think about what could be new in 2033 and mm -hmm. um so i think through that and the, the orientation we provided i think climate change was on people's minds um and you know th thinking about kind of not just you know trying to push to think about like not just liberatory education in our current world, but in the things that we're thinking are likely going to be true in 10 or more years. Um, there was a lot of interest in, in really considering, you know, what what could be necessary to help support people in, a, in an er era of intensified climate impacts. Well, these are two really, really good ideas. Uh, I mean, on, on the one hand, you have the, the really practical hands-on education aspect of getting out into the world. Um, and then you have the uh, another, which is also very, very practical, uh, where DNet uh, connects people um, across the world, if I understand this correctly, to uh, help them jumpstarting their lives in terms of food, housing, transportation, health, translation services, education, culture, employment, childcare, and legal counseling. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a real tremendous thing. I, it, it sounds to me like almost the start of a series of stories. Uh, where people could really help each other around the world. Yeah. Well, um, we have some questions from a, a few folks, and I want to give them a chance to um, put these on the screen here. Um, and again, if you're new to the forum, uh, these are Q&A questions. Uh, this is one uh, from uh, uh, Lindsay Lutman, the University of Arizona. Are there any known indicators that systems or artifacts might not align with the values and perspectives in the future? And what practices can help us create future-proof learning systems or artifacts? Oh, those are two questions. Hey, I'll put this back up because this is th these are both very, very rich. Here, uh, thank you, Lindsay, for these. Are there any indicators that systems or artifacts might not align with the values and perspectives in the future? I mean, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, Lindsay, we've been thinking a lot about how the values and perspectives that people bring to education are really fundamental to thinking about what they want for the future and what they'll advocate for. Um, so if we're thinking about kind of how contested our society is right now and the really political polarization we're living in, um, that clash or, de or debate among different kind of value sets, worldviews, perspectives feels really fundamental um to how we set up our education systems and the the practices that happen within and alongside them um even getting down to like competing ideas about what the purpose of education could be in, in various you know life stages jason would you add anything there yeah just um i'm not sure that our current system our current systems mirror our societal values and wants out of these systems Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that becomes an even harder question to answer in a futures context. So, you know, for us, we've got a particular set of values that were kind of articulated as an aspiration to move towards, you know, this kind of value enabled or values built uh, future of learning. 
And when we when we wrote the original forecasts that, that these artifacts relate to, we were looking at the question of, you know, how might liberatory education thrive in the future? So in some scenarios, it was more or less present in public education systems than in others. So it wasn't a given to us that we would have enough of a orientation to it like, systemically, structurally, values wise, that it would become like a dominant publicly accepted form of learning, but we thought that there were ways people could pursue it through micro schools and shadow structures, or maybe in public systems, um, but it, that we felt like there was a lot of uncertainty about the forms it could take. Interesting, interesting. Um, well, first of all, Lindsay, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. And and friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a, a Q&A question box type of question. Uh, Lindsay, I want to circle back to the second half of your question in a bit because we have a few more questions coming in. Um, but thank you both, uh, Jason and Catherine, for the, for the really solid answers. Uh, we have not such a, a, a question as a compliment coming in from uh, Craig Schleiber, or Schreiber. Uh, having spent my career trying to leave the industrial model of education behind, I applaud your approach in creating vision that we can move forward to rather than complaints. So bravo to both of you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, yeah. You know, oh, please go ahead. I was just going to say that's a lot of how we we tend to use foresight with the, you know, we have the luxury of focusing on education and, and foresight. And so we're really trying to help people get into that space of imagining possibilities and thinking about how to pursue mm -hmm. them while also attending to managing all the opportunities and challenges that are emerging as the world changes, but really trying to help people be creators of something they'd like to see. Nice. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we have uh, another powerful question uh, comes from our, our friend in Houston, Texas area, uh, Tom Hames. And Tom asks, was there any effort to turn this future thinking to concrete action at the school level? If we want to get there, what do we have to do next? And were the students left feeling empowered in this way? Hmm. So I'm going to give a very general uh, answer to this. So, it, so one, thank you for the tremendous question, right? And it's it's that's the like, what do you do with this? Or, or is anybody doing anything with this? Um, so we've had the pleasure to work with a, a variety of schools and, and other learning communities, uh, both in and out of school time learning organizations, um, around this body of work. So whether it was creating prototypes together to inform plans to move towards something or to bring sort of this idea of design futures into their curriculum so that they can then do this with stu with their own students. Um, we've been incredibly fortunate in that regard. The weakness of that model is we don't always have the relationship to know what they're doing and how they're doing it after we exit an engagement, but we've got some, some interesting ideas. So, uh, our friends in Pittsburgh at a group called Assemble are weaving this type of design thinking directly into their curriculum mm. in a program they call Hack the Future. So they're working with young people in a liberatory context to boldly imagine the future and then start to think about how that can impact their, uh, their community. We've worked with schools and employed this to augment um, things like strategic planning. And we've see, seen things come out of that that are pretty interesting, right? That range from how we might attend differently to social emotional needs to thinking differently about what an agentic learning environment looks like. Um, but we're always very curious to know where these things land after that engagement. Um, but we don't always have the privilege. Uh, Catherine, you, you might have some other insights that I don't. Um, I think with this piece in particular, you know, is really, I think, trying to incite or provoke like reflection and, and thought and application to one's context, either by saying, well, how might something like this exist here? Or whatever, regardless of what we put in the publication, how might we generate our own ideas to help us yeah. think about our yeah. own futures? Mm -hmm. So we were, I think, really trying to kind of help people practice that imagination muscle um mm -hmm. and you know a, a lot of what we see with the kind of work we get to do with people is that we're 
we're maybe helping to seed ideas and conversations and then they can have impacts a long time later. So it can be a kind of a long tail or people to really engage with the future and then make something real. Um, but by raising those kinds of strategic considerations that we've been alluding to, um, that the artifacts were designed around, you know, we try to give people those as anchor points just to think about, okay, we've explored a bunch of possibilities. What do we need to be addressing? So how might we channel technologies for liberation? Or like, how do we kind of attend to short-term needs while also our long-term goals? But um, in this particular work, we didn't get to get super specific about strategies for moving forward. I want to come back to the question about student empowerment too, because I'd be remiss if we didn't highlight a couple of folks involved with this project. So the illustrations you saw mm -hmm. uh, came from a student-led group called Artists for Humanity, who wow. they took our writing and translated this to some of these images. Oh, then good. we worked with youth too to put in the quotes and to kind of smooth out some of the artifacts. So there were three learners that we worked with from uh, a group in Nevada that we have the pleasure of working very deeply with uh, through the Nevada Future of Learning Network. Uh, these young folks play at the intersection of advocacy, policy, and foresight constantly. And uh, colleagues of ours, uh, consistently interact and partner with them. Um, so they're using foresight in, a, in a, a, a way that I would say is highly empowering to make the case for broader systemic change in, in Nevada, right? So I think that really is a, a concrete view or concrete uh, example of how this work can inform uh, broader efforts for systemic change. Wasn't directly pinned to this body of work, but they're, they constantly think about what that future state might be if personalization was the norm. And then they take those learnings back and start to advocate with uh, adults to say, how might we create this future? So it's admirable work. Uh, uh, I think that these young people are most definitely agents of change and employing these ways of thinking to create a better future for themselves and for all of the students in Nevada. Well, thank you. I, I, that's that's a lot more a lot more to learn about this project, and um, I, the student art is is terrific. Um, I've, I've been really fond of that. Um, well, thank you for the great question, as usual, Tom, uh, and thank you both for for delving into the answers, uh, Catherine and Jason. We have a couple more questions that, are, uh, that have been coming in, and I want to give everyone a chance. Here's one. I'll put my thumb on the scale in favor of my colleague Ijoma from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, Ijoma is a brilliant person. She asks a typically brilliant question. I'm super excited to hear about the participatory design used in this project. How and what kinds of diversity were you able to collaborate, to cultivate among the participants? Uh, so, uh, as much as we could possibly get within the within some constraints. So we were looking for obviously age, role, race uh and orientation or gender gender orientation in terms of this project um so we had representatives from just about every facet of our, a broad learning ecosystem from in school learning to out of school to higher ed to foundations to you know in innovation education innovation writ large um we had folks from all walks of life as part of this um, could it have been more diverse? Possibly, right? Um, but, we, you know, we were trying to, to lure as many folks as we could to our office in Cincinnati and, and to engage them as deeply as possible. And I, and I would say, like, more broadly, um, it's, it's it can be challenging to recruit the kinds of range of people we like to see in these kinds of ideation events. You know, it's um, sometimes we make assumptions that we can lean on this partner or that, or can advertise the opportunity in this way, and they don't always come to fruition. So we did have some fits and starts in recruiting for the workshop that informed this publication, and just an ongoing learning experience um, about how to how to bring people in, um, always within the constraints of kind of time and budget, and mm, yeah. it's been a person workshop geography. 
first of all, thank you for the very practical, direct answers to Ijoma's solid question. I, I'm just curious, if I could, at a, at a kind of in, institutional level, what what role did this project play within Knowledge Works? What was this? Um, how did this fit into Knowledge Knowledge Works operations and strategy? So. Exploring future possibilities is a, a key aspect of Knowledge Works thought leadership strategy, strategy dimension. Um, and it, as I've alluded to, every three years we publish an anchor forecast looking at broad possibilities. So the Liberatory Education Futures forecast that we been mentioning was one of those. And then in between times, we delve in to get more specific about opportunities, challenges, strategies related to those forecasts, or pick up topics that we we feel like warrant more exploration or we may pick up you know kind of just an adjacent topic sometimes so this fell within that kind of off cycle of we've, we've done a forecast we want to help people continue to grapple with it continue to see the possibilities and as jason alluded to we we're with this one really trying to help make what could feel very aspirational and yeah. possibilities more tangible to help people like continuing continue to imagine you know, how might we um, and then we had a couple opportunities to use some of the ideas with staff, including um, a fake announcement that Knowledge Works was at an all staff meeting that Knowledge Works was partnering with eco reclaimers. Like we were trying to like with this little like let's make the future real for our, our colleagues. Oh, yes. And then people were like, "Whoa, we're not actually partnering with them. That sounded cool." <laughs> ah, so we do that sometimes. We get a chance to play you know, with our own organization, in addition to having it be part of our um, our thought leadership strategy. That's really good. It's like an alternate reality game for this. That, <laughs> well, um, well, thank you. I mean, this this is, I, I think a lot of think tanks, a lot of research uh, uh, entities could really benefit from this kind of process. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question coming from our West Coast uh, friend, Mark Corbett Wilson. And he asked a question which, which pushes on something we mentioned earlier, um, whoops. Uh, he asks, please speak to how your work can be used by lifetime learners outside academic institutions. And which one of you wants to take that first? So uh, one, you know, the general answer, the futurist in me, right, wants to say, because everybody's got a vested interest in the future. So, um, so many of these examples in this publication uh, weren't school specific. So for a lifetime uh, learner like yourself, for a steward of the future like yourself, I think that you could start to translate a lot of these things into your own context, right? Whether that's working informally with other learning constituents in your community to say, hey, you know, maybe we could start to outline some aspirations for ourselves. Maybe we could start to think about what planning for uh, like resiliency and in, in, in terms of a, a climate, vol a, a volatile climate future, right? Um, you could take any of the methodologies or sense-making exercises in this publication and put it into your own context. It doesn't necessarily have to be school specific. Um, it could just be fun to dream about the future with other people and you could turn it into a game. It could be a vehicle for just local social cohesion is to say, if we, if we lower the temperature now, we could use the future as a third place to create these artifacts around learning that we all have uh, a certain responsibility for as adults, you know, for, to me, one of the, the most important jobs as an adult is to be an advocate for young people, to walk alongside them and make those futures come to fruition. So um, those are some of the ways I see it. Well, first of all, that's that's a great question. And this is this is a, a dear subject for Mark's uh, to Mark's heart and his work. I know um, and I hope Mark uh, Jason's answers were inspiring. Catherine, did you want to join in on that? Um. Maybe just to say, like, we've been, I, I think that there's a lot of possibility in the, we think when we're thinking about the future, learning to push our thinking into lifelong and life-wide learning and think beyond our current institutions. And I, I think that can be really challenging, if, especially when we bring the value of equity and opportunity for all as a filter, like, we tend to, uh, at least at KnowledgeWorks, we tend to gravitate to our public education systems because that's where 
more historically marginalized yet resilient learners access education. And yet, if we're responsible about thinking about future possibilities, we have to explore um, other structures and systems for young learners. And then, as we all know, you know, we're all going to be learning all our lives. And, and okay. we always had to, but but we also know the world's changing so quickly that we, we need to even more and more. So um, lots of reasons to think about learning in really broad ways. Thank you. Thank you. That's really meaningful. I really appreciate that, Catherine. Mark, please, thank you again for the for the spot on question. Uh, we have another one from uh, our best friend in Armenia right now, Brent Anders, who is uh, a terrific uh, scholar and practitioner on AI. And he asks an AI question. Uh, how did generative AI play into strategic foresight and state and district level engagements and collaboration uh, to develop AI literacy for all and to enhance the educational experience? I mean, I would wonder about your um, the iLearn artifact, for example. Yeah, we were. Right. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask to repeat the question once of more. Of course, of course. Sorry, sorry. I'll put I'll put it right back up for you here. Um, this is a question about generative AI and how does that play into into your strategic foresight work in state and district level engagements. And then he adds, uh, in terms of developing AI literacy for all. Thank you. Um, Catherine, you were about to answer it, so. Go ahead, if you would like, Jason. <laughs> I, it's it's unavoidable from the foresight side of things, right, is, is that we are asked a lot of questions, um, both inside our organization, frankly, and outside around uh, possibilities for generative AI. So um, I think all of our, our, our body of work uh, going back to 2005 uh, has a through line around accelerating technology. I think generative AI is, is the, the best example we can give of this in this moment and one that has people both excited and fearful. So we've looked at it in a variety of ways, right? From you know, possibilities around formative assessment and summative assessment to differentiation um, in terms of personalization, even for things like continuity of learning across um, like climate related disasters. We had a, a short provocation years ago called Follow Me Schools, which was like, can we offer somebody something better than hybrid learning, right? And what might that look like? So naturally through that exploration, one of the implications we fall on is the second part around AI fluency. Um, I just gave a talk, I had the privilege to give a talk to NADSEC, so uh, one of the national groups who certify teachers. Mm. And they were really curious about future sk knowledge, skills and dispositions for the educator workforce in a decade. And AI fluency uh, was one of their, their highest priorities. So AI fluency and data, data literacy. Uh, AI literacy and data as well as part of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's a, that's a good answer. And I, I, I appreciate your starting off with the, the sense of this being just inevitable or at least a major part of life. Um, Catherine, did you want to uh, add more to that? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you're right, Brian, that I learned we could assume would make use of generative AIs. It's a digital personalized way of finding life coach tool or companion. Um, so we've been imagining things like that for a while and um, continuing to think about kind of how AI might be present in future education settings or broadly in learning settings. Um, so a lot of what we get to do is um, since we're out ten year, in the 10 years or more space is kind of think about mm -hmm. broad possibilities while trying to keep, stay abreast of what's happening today. So one of the uncertainties, Jason, that you and others have identified as we've been exploring futures of formative assessment, what I think it's broader too, is the extent to which um, AI will be transparent and like discretionary, its recommendations discretionary in the future or whether it will be kind of more prescriptive and opaque. So that's one so one of the critical mm. uncertainties we're seeing mm. to really play how thing how it's used in education settings. 
there are people getting recommendations and they decide, does it make sense? I guess kind of understand how these decisions were made or are we in more kind of automated um, learning environments where we're having maybe personalized learning journeys assisted by AI, but we're not, we don't have a lot of choice in like whether we use the tools and you know, whether we follow its recommendations, that kind of thing. Okay. Well, this, this is great. Um, thank you both. Uh, this sounds like a pointers towards a whole uh, new report um, mm -hmm. uh, on the subject. Brent, uh, thank, thank you for the really good question. We, we have time for one last question. And in order to do this, I want to circle back to one that uh, Lindsay Lutman asked uh, early on. And, and this is the second half of her question. I just want to I want to pull this out because I think there's a lot there's a lot going on here. Um, uh, Lindsay asks if um, this is the second part of the question. What practices can help us create future-proof learning systems and artifacts? So, and Lindsay is an instructional designer. So I think in part thinking about either the, you know, working with education and technology or classroom design, but you know, how do, what, what do you think based on all your work that you've been doing now for several years plus, uh, how can people in the present uh, build stuff that is future-proof? It's one, that's a fantastic question. So I'm going to kind of go on to the, the fallback here, right? Is to start to build things that are future, future proof. We should have a perspective on the future, right? So for us, we would answer to say like some of what we was wrapped up in this in terms of speculative design and thinking about the future in a systematic or methodologically sound manner. And then to work backwards to design would be one of my recommendations. But I think at its core, whatever we're putting into practice, I think we have to recognize that those structures, those systemic structures at their core need to be nimble and flexible, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's one of the reasons we've seen a lot of interest again around ecosystemic models of education because they're innately flexible. They follow that complex adaptive system not to resist change, but to embrace it. Whereas now we have systems and structures that are indeed complex and adaptive, but they're so resilient that that flexibility in terms of overall systems change just isn't there. Ooh, well, that's got to be so hard since so much of uh, so much of instructional design now is really based on structures that are so uh, so rigorous and so static. Uh, you know, thinking about uh, the limits of enterprise software, thinking about budgetary constraints, and for public institutions, thinking about all the regulatory hurdles there. Yeah, it's, it's, and again, reflecting on my earlier experience with the NATSEC folks is they said the same thing, right? Is that we recognize we need to shift, that there's a whole continuum of skills and knowledge that our teachers need. But because we're stuck in, in sort of the loop of accreditation and having to seek accreditation with the proven models or the data is there, right? To embrace emerging models that might be largely student-centered that don't have all of the data behind it, the years and years and years and years of, of you know, tier one research um, becomes really, really hard, right? So, um, I think that there's a, an innate systems like design flaw there to say like, well, why can't we move towards those things? But also I understand the need to safeguard, right? You, we wanna train people around the things that we know to work while making space to adapt towards the things that we know we, we believe we will need. Mm -hmm. oh, that's that's really, really helpful. In, in, in the chat, uh, uh, we have a couple of good follow-ups to that. Um, our, our good friend, uh, Stephen Ehrman says, existential threats are the mothers of invention, uh, pressure to rethink core activities and goals. And uh, Tom Haymes says, the pupil is there by school to confuse teaching with learning, great advance with education, a diploma with competence and fluency with the ability to say something new. His imagination is schooled to accept service in place of value. I believe he's quoting uh, the great writer, Ivan Illich on that. Um, this is a, a a tremendous answer. Uh, and both of you, uh, Catherine and Jason, this has been great having you on the program. Uh, this this Artifacts project is just an inspiration and a delight. And it's been both an inspiration and a delight to have you here with us for the past hour. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. It's been an enjoyable conversation.
Oh, good. Well, let, let me ask, what's the best way to keep up with the two of you? Um, should we just keep uh, following the Knowledge Works website, or um, should we find either of you on social media? Following our website and subscribing to our newsletter will help you um, keep up with our latest publications. Um, you're welcome to get in touch by email, and our addresses are available via Knowledge Works website. Um, I am currently on LinkedIn, which is another option. Very good. Very good. And, and Jason, are we set with you? So um, the best way, as Catherine outlined, is, is through the site. I do not have a very active social media presence, but um, KnowledgeWorks as an organization does. Uh, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. So we're all over everything. And um, <laughs> they're, they're the best way to, to keep abreast of everything that's going on KnowledgeWorks related. and. Certainly you can reach us through the website and I would encourage you to do so. We always love talking about the future with anyone. People after my own heart. Thank you both so much. And uh, I, ho I hope Jason, you avoid storms. And uh, Catherine, please uh, keep Ohio safe for the rest of us. <laughs> That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, but don't go away yet, friends. Let me just point out a few things. If you want to uh, keep talking about these uh, these topics, including if you'd like to make some of your own artifacts, please just uh, keep up the conversation on the social media world. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE, and you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, or, of course, my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on everything from design thinking to future design to just about everything on higher education, just go to our archive, tinyurl.com slash archive. If you want to look at our sessions coming up, we have a whole bunch of topics from how to reform grading to what's happening with the workforce to a liberal universities and more. Just go to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, thank you all for the really thoughtful questions. It's been great talking about this with you today. I hope everybody's well as we're about to plunge into July. I hope you're all safe and sound. And we'll see you all next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.